much. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that lovely introduction. And it's lovely to be here. This is really, really exciting. It's lovely to see so many of my students. Thank you all for coming. It is an absolute pleasure to be here. And it is a real honour to read with Jack, who you were just absolutely fantastic. And Stephen, you were absolutely fantastic too. And this is this is just a really great and exciting thing. So, so thank you all so much. Um, I'm going to read... Uh, I'm going to read part of um, a long poem, not all of it, um, just some sections of it. And it was commissioned um, it was commissioned last year, and I wrote it in three months. And um, I was asked to do an updated canto of Byron's Don Juan, and I said yes very enthusiastically without having read Byron's Don Juan. Um, and then I read Byron's Don Juan, and luckily I absolutely loved it. Um, and I loved its energy and its political uh, drive and its wit and its anger um, and his fabulous rhymes. Um, and the remit was that uh, it's, an, it's, it's a contemporary canto, so Don Juan has to exist in it, and he has to be called Donald Johnson. It has to be written in... <laughs> It has to be written in the Byronic stanza, so it has to be written in Ottawa Grima. Um, and it has to deal with something contemporary. Um, so I said it in November 2012, um, and it's about the Euro crisis, particularly as it unfolded or is unfolding in Greece, given that um, Byron died in Greece um, and has connections to that country. Um, in Canto 13 of Don Juan, um, which is all about money, he says, and money, that most pure imagination. Um, and I think that that's very apt in terms of where we are at the moment in the world. So I'll just read three of the sections. And um, Byron's Don Juan begins, I am in want of a hero. One. This is Don Juan, 2012. We need a hero. The time is out of joint, has burnt its fragile socket, while for the Mayans who read their dazzling mountain stars like newsprints, transcribing mankind's pre-allotted lifespan, by 2012, there's simply no more of it. God's 18th century clock has winded down. We're at the end, or so the websites warn us, of everything we know and value precious. I'm usually unconvinced, convinced instead, that end of history talk is soon demolished by history's own refusal to be led into some silent terminus. Things may not flourish. We may be colder, hungrier, more upset by the growing list of what's been taken from us, but even lame, thin, choking and at variance with the riches of before will falter on regardless. Now I'm not so sure. Take this week's news. A cataclysm, a Herculean storm, unlike anything even Al Gore lent shape to, is closing in, caused partly by a shifting jet stream, partly by the pole ice melting through. A rough beast rising as the oceans warm. We watch its blue-white swirl by satellite on flashy CNN, like spies on our own planet. We watch it hit. They've timed it to the seconds. A waterproofed and clearly mad reporter getting tossed across a junction by the wind, then back again up to his calves in water, tries to speak to us, but his voice is drowned. The anchor woman smiles and leaves him there, shuttling between the leaning trees and the signals as the rain rolls over him and the picture fails. By morning, we're in aftermath a bird's eye view. Parks and streets submerged in the ravaged cities, sheets of pewter sea blown into a new transplanted element, kilometers of debris. The Northeast National Grid has blown its fuse. The graces we now live by, transport, electricity, that house us all in rooms of heated glass, lie savage and defunct as the cable telegraph. And how much will it cost, dear Lord, the cost? Tens of billions, according to the Guardian, on insurance claims alone for what's been lost. Since the financial crisis, we can't imagine what so many profligate zeros, nestled close, reproduced 
like cells have come to mean. They march across our headlines, black and crass, and always with a minus sign attached. A little while ago in Houston, Texas, three awfully clever men invented something very deft and bold and half miraculous. A fresh, creative way to run accounting, and why not, whereby losses make a plus. They made wealth up, income, future earnings, so that sign without a signifier, wild in its own unfettered realm, money multiplied. Until it crashed, oh what a falling off. While thousands lost their pensions, they went to jail in handcuffs, though sadly not for long enough and not before their brainchild had gone viral. Soon debt became a bargainable stop, and the trick with debt, how it loves to dive and spiral a ballooning asset. Champagne baths on Wall Street, the fizz of endless cash and nothing cheap, not even escorts at legitimate expense, and certainly not the cars, the drugs, accessories for adventure sports, the loft apartments. But holes are holes, no matter how unholily they may be cloaked with crafty argument and Enron's falling off just mere pin prickery compared to the current void. A chasm splits the contours of the earth, we're staring into it. Like attack of the giant crabs, the killer spiders, small and normal creatures malformed by radiation. All the hidden, less than zero numbers, tired of being barred like ruined cousins from civilized conversation, staged a takeover. We're starving, they announced, and we are legion. The mega banks went first, their secret debts devoured them from within, then spat them out. The other banks we salvaged with our taxes. And for what? Their doors stay double bolted, while talk of what we haven't got in practice is all the rage since money's lack revolted. Nothing's offered, no credit, ready cash, no sweet forgiving margin. Those evicted from the homes they can't afford, who bought too late, live someplace other than on ghost estates. The outlook's bleak. We're inside a climacteric our baby boomer parents never dreamt of, who grew up in the groove of post-war pop music, who always had a job, who shared their love. As weather forecasts grow apocalyptic, as doubting politicians lose their nerve, as markets tumble, as what we are told we'll owe engulfs our children's children, we need a hero. Johnson, after um, a life roaming the world and lots and lots of womanizing, he is 63 years old and he has found a job as an attaché in the European Parliament. And um, the minister that he works for um, sent him on a fact finding mission to Greece in November 2012 to see how austerity is working out. And he takes a plane and um, he's never been to Greece before, he's quite excited and he takes a plane. And he meets um, a woman on the plane who introduces herself as Persephone. Um, and they have a little romantic person on the plane. And then he gets off and, uh, and we take it up there. <coughs> what is it we fear? We fear the loss of whatever it is we set about our hearts to keep life slicing cold at bay. A house food supply, coins that hold their worth from one day to the next, a health service. We fear the loss of a perpetually generous earth. We fear the end of buses, the closure of stores. We fear a return to conditions between the wars, when ragged men in lines brought all they owned, a battered bowl and spoon to public kitchens, when governments were fractured, jelly-boned, and hostage to a mass enraged sedition that ushered in such darkness, light was doomed. We fear a return to the old road into London, where mothers left their babies in their hundreds to die of cold and lack of power.
parish funds. In 2012, on the 13th of November, all over Greece, in Athens, on the islands, in the agricultural north, loss is ruler, and only the slick and sheltered rich withstand its hunger. Every flat, every schoolyard and taverna plays its host, and should the honeyed sirens still exist, their singing would be rent with Greece's wailing and turn into lament. The airport's crazy. Just the day before, a budget slashing billions yet again from salaries and services was deplored around the chamber, then passed by a squeaky margin. Another national strike looms like a downpour. The rush to leave in advance of a total shutdown is panic-stricken. Donald doesn't feel well. He takes a taxi to a moderate hotel, showers, cleans his teeth and falls asleep in a room that's beige and redolent with smoke and dreams a lake. He's standing ankle deep and then he's flailing underwater and he chokes and then he stops. He looks, trapped in reeds, a long-haired, staring girl. He jolts awake. Outside on the street, two men are arguing. Their voices play like scales, rising, falling, rising. It doesn't end. The clock says eight. He thought it would be earlier, but the difference in the hour, how did he sleep so late? The room is dark. Headlights luminescence moves around the walls. He needs to eat, shake off the wide-eyed girl, experience the city in the evening, start making notes. He stows his wallet and his phone inside his coat, ignores the lift, trips down the dusty stairs, and is in the lobby, striding towards the exit, when he sees her, straight-backed in an armchair, waiting. She's changed, no longer in a suit, but in a dress, not wearing makeup, older. He told her nothing, now he thinks of it. Nothing about his life, his job, the reason for the trip. Did she follow him? Mr. Johnson, she stood to stop him leaving. He brushes past. I'm here to introduce you to the current facts. My car is waiting. And the strangeness of the day, it's working loose of steady, regular stuff. Read sleep and kissing, like a tongue around a half extracted tooth, goes up one notch. He finds himself disarmed inside her car as the door is being slammed, Persephone beside him in the back, a wordless driver skulking in the front, the night both brightly lit and densely black, unravelling by his window, and what he wants to say, how dare you, vanishing like a snowflake on a spit. He tries to speak, but can't. Athens seems normal, lovers hand in hand, illuminated bars, tobacco stands, like any typical European capital, with tree-lined avenues of modern flats, market squares packed tight with canvas stalls, displays of jewels and shoes and sequined hats gleaming in the darkness, a city hall fronted by gushing fountains. Though there are rats. He spots one as they angle round a corner, flashed up by the headlights, then another, then another, fast and fat and freakish, running out of pipes or into drains. The streets are twitching. Tottering piles of rubbish begin to catch his eye. They turn again into a major thoroughfare. He hadn't noticed, but garbage bags are everywhere, thrown in heaps round litter bins, clogging doorways, the refuse of the city left for days. Welcome to the winter of our discontent. It's lasted years, but now it's getting worse. We borrow double for every euro spent. There's a bottomless pit in place of the public purse that can't be filled, though each successive government tries its best. This is our constant curse, like Sisyphus. Sirens tear the air. She leans forward in her seat, in Tagman Square. Square St. Tagma Square's on fire, boots and batons, petrol bombs and bricks. They've strung up Merkel's portrait on a wire. They've burned the German flag for bitter kicks. They've dumped the euro symbol on the pyre and asked police to suck their fucking pricks. It's blazing, it's amazing, it's a whirl with tear gas and cannons down in the underworld. <laughs> 
What do you get if you slice a loaf in half, then half, then half again? Answer, hungry. What do you get if you lay off half your staff, the public civil servants of your country, then threaten to axe the rest? Wheat from chaff, or this sudden icy plunge into mere anarchy? You face two doors, an outdoor and an indoor. Their signs are hidden, but both of them are trap doors. Eight little Indians gayest under heaven, seven little Indians chopping up sticks. One went to sleep, then there were seven. One chopped himself in half, and then there were six. And there's never any chance of getting even, and the wings to lift you out of here are wax. One little Indian left all alone. He went out and hanged himself, and then there were none. The roar increases. A camera crew retreats. The riot squad advances like a wall. Huddled against Persephone, Donald sweats. He doesn't want to stay with her at all, but there's smoke and screaming out there on the streets, and he doesn't know the way to his hotel. As though she's made her point or read his mind, she clears her throat, the car backs round a bend, then screeches off untouched. They roll along past empty restaurants, strings of shuttered shops, an ambulance growing fainter like a song on a turned-down radio until it stops. Persephone says, This order will go on. They'll broadcast it as students versus cops, but it's everyone. The people have no choice. They're damned already. Donald finds his voice. Where are we headed to next? A quiet place. Oh, the relief of that. To a garden. They're there in minutes. A residential space between two railway lines overgrown with weeds and shards and dubious sorts of waste. The kind of neglected bypass gypsy rotten where immigrants begin their new existence overlooked by us except there's silence no lights on in the flats no signs of cooking no children on the swing that someone's improvised no beat up vans or bikes no tethered washing who were they these were syrians terrorized by assad and his overindulged in bombing of hospitals and schools but greece is immunized Europe's most porous border no longer leaks. We round them up and house them all in concrete, 30 to a cell, Iraqis, Afghans. And if they come by boat, our coast patrols do their damnedest to ensure they never land. A train grinds by, transparent as a fishbowl, its passengers bright and separate, elsewhere bound, who stare ahead. The wind is moaning cold. A front door hanging slant like a flap of skin, bangs and bangs. Persephone sits waiting. There's one last site, a temple we should visit, out at Sunion. Let's get started. And they drive. He finds her stern and forthright. The woman on the plane, a lie imparted according to his known prerequisites, a satin mask. Among the dear departed, she shall reign, cruel, true unwavering. She carries out the curses of the living upon the souls below and knows no anguish. This rings inside his head like burning scripture. Soon Athens' dish of radiance is eclipsed. The road winds up through trees. They park and bear a roofless columned hall upon a cliff. The sea beneath a drop of sixty meters, sighing on the stones. Lord Byron came and in the marble chiselled out his name. But to us this place is famous for Aegeus, father of Theseus, who forgot to change his sails from black to white. Although he returned victorious from the labyrinth, his father thought he'd failed. He glimpsed the ship and, frenzied with distress, jumped from the cliff and gave this sea its name. Donald surveys the wide and smooth Aegean, the temple's broken tribute to Poseidon, wind plucking at his coat and at his hair, and wonders why they're there. Since last year, suicide in Greece has grown more popular. Wives and daughters, sisters, nephews, brothers, instances have doubled. Some favour here, it's desolate and high without a barrier, and like Aegeus, they strew the sea beneath them with what is left when all their hope is 